All right, it looks like we've uh, reached the top of the hour now, and uh, we can go ahead and get started with the presentation. Uh, ben Shackman, I am the Midwest Regional Manager here at Triple Point Environmental. I cover 13 states plus three provinces of Canada, so I get around a good bit. I, I do have a quick administrative note also. Uh, following the conclusion of the broadcast today, a certificate will pop into your email in approximately one hour. Uh, if for some reason you don't see your certificate before the end of the day, please give it a minute. Uh, kindly send an email to eve, E-V-E, at lagoons.com, and she'll figure out where it went and get you scored away. Uh, also, I was asked to remind you that there's a survey at the end of the broadcast, and if you would please spend just a couple of minutes on that and let us know how we're doing. It, it's always beneficial to have some feedback. So, folks, here's what we're talking about today. Uh, we're going to go ahead and talk through the agenda you see on the screen. I'm going to get rid of my camera here so that uh, we're a little bit more conservative on bandwidth and works a little better. There we go. That should have taken care of that. All right. So I need my next slide. And there we go. We are off to the races. Uh, so I'm the Midwest Regional Manager. I live in St. Louis, Missouri, and also up in Birchwood, Wisconsin. I'm coming to you today uh, from the house in Birchwood. Happy to be at the lake. Been knocking around the water industry for about 10 years now, and yeah, my wife and I are, oh, we, we're general aviation and travel enthusiasts. We've got a couple of kids, uh, one adult daughter over in Cleveland, and our younger daughter is at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, where my wife and I both met. So we went, you could say we went one for two on getting our kids to go to our school. A uh, triple point on the screen now. Inc. Magazine named us one of the 5,000 fastest growing companies in the United States. They've actually extended that honor to us a couple of times now. And another one that we're very, very proud of, uh, the regionals list, the top 250 in the Midwest. Uh, we've been included on this list a couple of times, and I can tell you that we're pretty proud uh, to be sitting in the number two slot on that list in 2021. A couple of reasons for that. Uh, the first of which is that the folks that beat us don't do anything with wastewater. The second reason is that the majority of our competition in the, uh, in the lagoon industry uh, is also Midwestern companies headquartered in the Midwest. It's kind of nice to have that recognition. It probably has a lot to do with the uh, with the installation history that we have here at Triple Point. And I'll, I'll say right now, if you can read that on a small screen, the United States Air Force needs to have a conversation with you. They need those skills. It's a bit of an eye chart, so I'll just give you a couple of key points from it. Going back to 2003, our low flow is 5,000 gallons a day, and our high flow on, on the pages here is uh, 13 MGD, 13 million gallons a day. Uh, we, we do projects all over the world between those flow rates, and we've actually done a project as large as 24 MGD, uh, an industrial one that's not in the United States. Any given year, about half of our revenue is coming from municipal and the other half from industrial, and we're, uh, we're excited to be doing the amount of work we're doing these days. So that was it on all the company stuff, and now we're into the content. Uh, let, let's let's do an overview. Let's start right there. Let's understand, first of all, that about one third, one third of all wastewater facilities in the continental United States are lagoon systems. Uh, they're found more so in the Midwest for a number of reasons, population density being one of them, cost of land being another. And as a best estimate, there are about 8,000 of these lagoons around the United States with about 60% of them facultative. No aeration, just a big hole in the ground that you dump dirty water in. And through the miracles of God and microbiology, something in the range of 30 to 180 days later, you get a whole lot cleaner water out the back end of the process. Continuing the discussion about the overview here, uh, it's important to understand the impact of, of sludge. Sludge accumulation is part of running a lagoon system. You can't properly manage or maintain your lagoon system unless you understand that. And you should really know a thing or two about the stuff also. And we're going to talk about it today some too. Uh, but just know that the sludge accumulation that you see at the bottom of your pond 
uh, that's yielding lower retention time. Uh, consequently, you're getting less treatment and you're gonna see higher, higher uh, BOD, higher biochemical oxygen demand in your effluent. Uh, as you go deeper, you get more bubble rise time and that leads to a greater oxygen transfer efficiency. Uh, standard oxygen transfer efficiency is the acronym on the screen. Uh, it would be just regular old oxygen transfer though in a uh, lagoon system and you gotta take contaminants and a few other things into account. Uh, but thinking about that sludge very specifically, a question that I get all the time, I, I was literally asked this question yesterday. What is Triple Point's view on too much? What constitutes too much sludge? When do we have to do it versus maybe we do it, maybe we don't. If I do it, I mean remove the sludge. And I'll tell you that for a 10 to 13 foot pond, we're, we're pretty fond of an 18 inch number as a threshold. Uh, below that number, you're not gonna see a great a great degradation in treatment. Um, you're not gonna have a great potential for feedback. Some, of course, not, not a great potential. And you're not, getting into the, you're not getting into the territory where you've just got really, really old, dense sludge. 18 inches is a reasonable number in a eight, 10, 12 foot pond. On top of that, your supernanor, your affluent, that's sitting there. And then you could say it's temporary liquid storage at the top. And then this, this is a great piece of conversation here, this discussion of freeboard. Freeboard for a lagoon operator is nothing more than peace of mind. It is the ability to stack water until the time is right to discharge it. And that could be any number of different reasons. I can tell you folks that we have an operator over in Michigan that knows no emergencies with his pond system. The reason is he's got a uh, continuous discharge pond but he runs it controlled. If he's taking the day off, he closes the effluent. If he's going on vacation, he closes the effluent. He stacks water. If he's not discharging, he can't possibly have an emergency. And it's just how he's running his system. But he's doing that because he knows and he understands his freeboard and he's able to use it to his advantage. So sludge is next on the screen here. And you know, first off, a question, what is this stuff? And the answer is that it, it contains some amount of just about everything that enters the lagoon. Just about everything that comes into your system is gonna show up in your sludge. The big building blocks that, the, you know, for any life form, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, and then you see smaller amounts of some other constituents that get mixed in. And again, it's got everything in there. Everything that's coming into your pond is gonna show up in your sludge in one, one form or another. And it's important to understand that what the EPA calls that thing out there is a sludge storage lagoon. It is not a wastewater treatment lagoon. According to the EPA, it's a sludge storage lagoon. The treatment has happened coincidentally and we're doing the right things to set the stage to get the treatment we want, but we have to keep sludge in mind for a number of reasons right there on the screen. It's displacing water, reducing volume and treatment time and treatment. Uh, it feeds algae and you have the potential for feedback. We'll talk a little more about feedback later, but uh, just know that every, every one of those organisms that's living in your pond system, that's absorbing uh, the stuff you saw on the last screen, the carbon, the hydrogen, the oxygen, the nitrogen, the potassium, the sulfur, all of that stuff, all of that stuff that's locked up in their cellular structure, when they reach the end of their life cycle and die, there isn't an offsite funeral that little organism is falling to the bottom of the pond and becoming part of the sludge. And all of, those, all of those things that were bound up in its cellular structure, they're all potentially subject to re-release. And I have a recommendation here. You're gonna see a bunch of recommendations throughout this presentation, but I recommend having a, having a conversation, doing a little research and understanding what is your, what is your sludge accumulation rate and what is your desludging interval? How quick are you picking up sludge? And you know how, how many years should you expect to be able to run the system? Once you've got that information, if you're running a municipal system, I encourage you to have a chat with council. Let them know where you're at in the life cycle of the system. Let them start thinking about the idea. Don't wait until they're surprised to tell them the sludge has got to come out. No, by the way, there's a six-figure bill attached to it and we don't have any money. 
make it known in advance and be sure that as government as government changes and you get a new council, a new mayor, make sure you're introducing the idea that we, we've got this uh, we've got this requirement that's hanging over our heads in, in the future here. Don't don't keep it to yourself, please. And I think it's really important to be able to describe your sludge. You should survey it, characterize it, and you should track it historically. On the uh, right side there, a picture of a sludge judge. That is a whole lot of sludge in that sludge judge, isn't it? That's a deep, deep sludge blanket there. A bit more than 18 inches, I think. So uh, thinking about the eventuality of removing the sludge, there, it's important to understand that there are pluses and minuses to all options. Uh, triple point is not in the sludge removal business. Um, we just have some opinions. Uh, dry removal, where you pump all of the water out and you let the sun bake that material for a while. Maybe you're stirring it, agitating it, doing something to encourage it to dry out faster. Uh, but then you're in there with earth moving equipment and it's mechanical removal. You are You are pushing, pulling, grabbing, dragging that sludge right out of the pond system. That's dry removal. Wet dredging is a completely different story. In wet dredging, you're putting a, a boat of some sort out on the pond. It's got a dredge attached to it. That's a long arm that sticks down. Some are articulated and they can steer them around. Uh, but then you're basically using that to scrape the bottom of the pond. Uh, some problems that can occur with wet dredging. If you've got a liner, it's, there's a potential to damage a liner. Uh, the other thing, and this is this is a really interesting, uh, really interesting little factoid. Uh, looking at particulate settling velocities, it's not unusual to find incredibly fine particles with settling velocities that look like a meter a year, or maybe two years for a meter of settling. Wet dredging, you wind up with settling. You wind up with uh, stirred up solids in your in your pond and. You know, they'll present an issue in your effluent. It presents as TSS, and that'll go on for possibly a year or two, depending on size of particulate, depth of pond, all of these things, lots and lots of variables. Where your effluent structure is located affects it too. Uh, so a couple of different options. I can tell you at triple point, we're of the opinion that you get a better end result with dry removal. Not everyone has the ability to do that. You've got to have something to do with that water and, and your treatment requirements while you're waiting for it to all dry out and everything. Geotubes, neat idea. Basically, you're pumping the sludge into a large tube on the bank. Uh, it, you know, you're, you're adding some polymer as it's going in there, and uh, then you're dewatering. And the dewatering, the decant, is running back into the pond, so you don't have an SEO or anything like that. Uh, the last one I have on the screen there is bag of bugs. You, you can go to any of the vendors out there that sell, sell bugs for my excuse me, for wastewater treatment and tell them you need a sludge reducer, SRV, sludge reducing bacteria. Uh, you, you throw them in, you get a little bit of impact, you know, depending on your organic percentage, of course, you may see a nice, a nice amount of impact. Uh, but it's sort of a one-time use. It isn't anything that's going to stick around or give you an enduring uh, benefit. Uh, it'll remove the sludge, you know, reduce the sludge, I should say, not remove, reduce the sludge uh, by some percent of the organic component of it. And uh, then the rest of it just remains, the inorganic remains. So to understand a, a sludge survey, I encourage you, I encourage you, make a plan, create a grid. This is a great way to think about this. Make this grid. And if you want, you can stretch, uh, you can stretch rope across the pond, you can stake it off, uh, how, however is going to work best for you. Uh, but create this whole plan on shore, not once you're already in the boat. And when you're taking readings, understand that not only does accuracy matter, but inaccuracy can be very expensive. And when you think about giving a contractor a, a job, you're, you're awarding a job. It may be removal of uh, 50 dry tons of, uh, of solids from the, from the pond system. Uh, what happens if they pull out 75? They're not going to say, hey, buddy, do your math a little better next time. No, they're going to hand you a bill. You're getting a big old change order at that point, because if you don't understand your sludge and what you've got in there, how much of it there is, you're, you're just accepting a lot of risk. You're probably going to wind up spending more than you need to. And uh, just understand that sludge is money to a removal contractor. So you're out there, you're, you're capturing your data. 
please write it down somehow, some way. It doesn't have to be real fancy. You don't have to direct enter it into a spreadsheet. You can use a piece of cardboard box. I recommend having someone to write while someone else is taking the readings. It's a whole lot easier. You also wind up with uh, readings that you can read. And that's on there in the screen too, because you know at the end of the day, you get done taking all these readings. If you can't read them, unfortunately, you haven't accomplished a whole lot. And please don't lose it once you get it done. I recommend when it's all finished, take a picture of it. If you lose that piece of cardboard, you've got it on your phone. And turn it into a nice report. Do it in writing and save a copy. If you don't already, start a binder, put it on the desk. I'm sorry, put it on the bookshelf behind your desk and just keep track of your sludge. Track it. Understand when you're seeing more and less accumulation. We talked the 18 inch piece a little bit already. Uh, but down at the bottom, I want to point this out, uh, characterization data. There's, that's a summary. That's an example of, of what it looks like when you send a sample out and they come back and tell you that you are, in this case, uh, where are we, like 44% volatile, I think, on that one. But record it, track it, save a copy, keep it in a binder where it's easy to find. You're going to hear me say a few times today, make a copy, put it in writing, keep it in a binder. I am a Big, big fan of the idea of just have a binder for the different things that you need to be able to reference so that you can keep your system running right. Uh, the biology of the stuff, it's anaerobic. It's all the way down at the bottom of the pond. And even our aerators that are sitting a couple of inches off of the bottom of the pond, you're, you're not oxygenating real well down there. So we're still calling it an anaerobic area. Uh, you've got acid, acid formers. You've got bugs producing methane. Uh, you're storing nutrients. We talked a little bit about the idea that everything that the organisms uptake or assimilate uh, during their life, it, it's subject, some amount of it is subject to re-release uh, once they become part of the sludge blanket. And I'm going to hammer on this bottom one here because this is really important. Uh, if you have a plater in town, if you have aerospace in town, if you have heavy industry in town, uh, it, it's so important to understand what's in their affluent and have it properly characterized. So plating, as an example, uh, one, of the, one of the waste products created is hexavalent chrome. Hexavalent chrome is a known carcinogen. It's a regulated material. And if it shows up in your sludge, you're not going to landfill it in a regular sanitary landfill. No, it's going to be far, far more expensive to get rid of that sludge. A nice thing about about hex chrome and a lot of the a lot of the other regulated materials as well is that the uh, government has assigned what they call cradle to grave liability to the generators. So if you have industry in town that's generating this stuff, that's creating it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether they go out of business. It doesn't matter uh, how big of a company they become for the entirety of the life cycle of that that material and. and you and I don't think about life cycles in terms that, uh, you know, metals and ponds think about it. It's elemental stuff here. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're responsible for that. So if you don't know what's in your pond, if you don't know what you're receiving from industry, how can you possibly assign the responsibility to them? And I would say that it's a whole lot easier to assign responsibility now as opposed to 10, 20 years down the road when maybe it's an issue. So understand your, understand your connections, understand what they're sending you, understand what's showing up in the middle of the night. It may surprise you. And be careful, because if you've got a lot of extra stuff in your sludge, you could be looking at a, a bigger bill for disposal, and that doesn't necessarily come from you. That, that can come from the generator. So algae's up next. Is it a friend? Is it a foe? Hey, it depends. There's no one statement to make about algae. We've got a bit of conversation on the topic. So in facultative systems, we're going to start out there. Uh, facultative system, you don't have mechanical aeration, uh, usually about three to eh, seven or so feet deep. Over on the right side of the screen, by the way, you remember that comment I made about it's a sludge storage lagoon? That's the source right there. It is in that publication that it's referred to as a sludge storage lagoon. You have an aerobic layer over an anaerobic layer, the anaerobic layer down where the sludge is, the aerobic layer in a facultative system. There's no aeration, no blowers, no aerators, none of that stuff. It's just wind out, wind energy. But algae helps too. And we're going to talk about that here as well. 
Uh, so detention time, it's going to depend a lot on the, on the uh, location. The further north you get, the colder it gets, the longer you want to hold on to that water. Why? Well, microbial activity doubles or halves with every 10 degrees plus or minus in temperature. So knowing that the bugs are moving slower, knowing that they're consuming the waste slower, it makes perfect sense that we would need to keep the water in the pond longer, longer, longer detention times in colder climates. Also, you see a characterization of the effluent that looks a little different than uh, an aerated system would look, looks a lot more generous. And why? Because you don't have so many things that you can do. You can't just simply turn up the blowers in response to an upset condition. And I've got to point this out. I love this quote here. The key to successful operation of this type of pond is O2 production by the photosynthetic algae and or reaeration at the surface. Algae becomes part of your oxygen transfer strategy if you're running a facultative system. You can't get rid of it. Again, about 60% of the systems in the United States are facultative these days. And uh, depths, we talked that a little bit already. And algae assists with uh, oxygen transfer during the day. It's consuming the CO2 that is a byproduct of, of the heterotrophic activity in the pond. Uh, the consumption of BOD results in CO2, you know, bug farts, if you will, and uh, algae consumes that. Algae sucks them up. It sucks up all that CO2 and it turns it into oxygen, O2. But during the night, during the night, this process changes and algae respires. It consumes oxygen and your DO can crash. And I love this statistic. I, I, that is just neat. A pound of algae can generate 1.6 pounds of oxygen per day, per day when the sun's shining. Wow, that's a lot. And, you know, it's not a surprise given that fact that you can see afternoon DO levels. This is in the top couple of inches of your pond. Uh, and think about a nice wind, a nice sunny day, lots of photosynthesis, good oxygen transfer across the liquid air interface. And it, it's not unusual to hit 30 or 40 milligrams per liter in that very, very top strata of the water column for free. Algae did that. You spent zero dollars. That is really cool, I think. And also algae's impact on pH. You can actually get a better performing pond based on algae, algae elevating your pH. If you get it all the way up above about eight and a half, 8.5 standard units, uh, hydrogen sulfide, the molecule just simply falls apart. It disassociates and no more stink. And that's really cool too. So uh, algae, it's consuming nitrogen and phosphorus. We talked about those nutrients being bound up in the cellular structures and then the potential for feedback after death. You can actually repollute water. You, you can have what you can take a reading at the entrance to your final cell and the exit to your final cell. And you can see that you're somehow growing uh, growing those nutrients, growing nitrogen, growing phosphorus, hot feedback, feedback from the slug. We talked about um, algae as it as it's alive and living in the pond, but when uh, when when you try to filter it out, I can tell you, folks, I, I'm a dog lover. I'm not a cat fan, but if you've ever watched a kitty cat squeeze through a teeny tiny little opening and just scratch your head, how in the world did that thing do that? Just know that algae does the same thing. It's able to squeeze through teeny tiny little openings, far smaller than the size of the organism when it's alive, but it becomes a bit more rigid in death and, and then it, it can be filtered pretty easily. I think it's important to understand the impact on the BOD5 test. And there was an earlier slide I talked about being a diurnal organism and you know it, it respires, it constitutes an O2 demand inside of your sample bottle. You pack your sample, you put it in a box, it's in the dark. It's sitting in the dark all the way to the lab. But the algae that's in there, it's still consuming oxygen. It's still exerting a demand. And consequently, dead and decaying algae equals BOD plus nutrient re-release. Folks, if you Google BOD5 algae impact, you'll find as one of the first results a fact sheet from the EPA. Uh, Steve Harris is who put this together for him, and he's one of our very favorite consultants here at Triple Point. Uh, Steve's fact sheet shows uh, BOD increasing dramatically based on algae. And the example provided, I'm going to show it to you in a second, 100 milligrams a liter of uh, biochemical oxygen demand, 94 milligrams per liter coming from algae. Wow. 
Wow, that's a lot. So it's got a positive impact. It's, uh, it's accomplishing BOD removal. It's a food source. Uh, you've got nutrient removal via assimilation, that double-edged sword we talked about. Uh, you know, it's locked up in the cellular structure during life. After death, it's subject to re-release. Feedback, benthal feedback if we're talking ammonia. There's a neat term. Uh, bacteria discharge CO2. We, we talked about that as part of the digestive process. That's pushing pH down. Algae's conversion of that back to O2 and returning it to water column is pushing pH up. And algae is saturating the water with DO. You're getting natural oxidation of the sulfides by reducing the sulfates and less odors as a result. Uh, pushing the pH up discourages the growth of some pathogens. It can inactivate certain organisms. You've got, oh, and it's, it's impact. pH's impact on ammonia is really, really neat also. Above about 8.2 standard units, uh, ammonia can exist in its gaseous state, and you can off-gas through volatilization. There we go. Uh, and then precipitation of metals. If you've got those metals in your ponds, they'll precipitate easier at a higher pH. Flipping over and looking at algae in an aerated system. Uh, by definition, algae in an aerated system is total suspended solids. And I love this quote here from Steve. Uh, During the spring and summer, most of the lagoon's effluent BOD could be caused by algae. We saw that on that fact sheet a couple of minutes ago. Uh, 94 out of 100 milligrams per liter in that example coming from algae. And you've got some counts and yields that you see and what that looks like in terms of a concentration milligrams per liter. And each, each milligram per liter of algae solids is going to result in about a half a milligram per, per liter of uh, CBOD, carbonaceous uh, biochemical oxygen demand. Uh, algae in a sample can be a problem. It's in there. It's consuming the DO. Your DO isn't going to look like it did when you drew that sample. And, uh, you know, increased algae is just going to lead to increased sludge accumulation. The more organisms you have in the pond, the more, the more mass they have as they go through their life cycle, the more mass is being contributed to the sludge. And algae and sludge seem to have a somewhat symbiotic relationship. Algae, some versions of algae, some variants of algae feed on sludge and populations grow. And then with seasonal die-off, you're just you're you're contributing more organic material to the uh, to the sludge at that point through seasonal die-off. A little bit symbiotic in nature. And algae's positive impact on aerated systems. We had a few slides for facultative systems, but we've got what? Three bullets here for aerated systems. And I'll tell you, George, Car George Carlin's one of my favorite comedians. And I mean, that shrug is just classic. There is such a gigantic difference between the amount of benefit that algae uh, provides in a facultative system compared to an aerated system that it's not, it's not an unreasonable thing to have lots of conversations about killing algae in aerated systems because it just isn't doing a whole lot for you, really and truly. Not like a facultative system. And abatement is, uh, is a big conversation to have. Uh, one of my favorite references for understanding facultative lagoons on the screen. And if you go take a look at table 14.1, they will show you physical, chemical, biological mate measures that you can take to get rid of algae, to reduce algae, to abate algae, including barley straw, even using barley straw as a, as a method. We're going to talk through a selection of these next. So aeration is not on the screen. Why? Because we're talking facultative. You can't aerate if you don't have blowers and aerators, facultative systems. And abatement is big business. Uh, I can tell you on the screen right now, I have worked for two of these companies and three of these companies have been customers of mine in water treatment. Big business, big, big business trying to get rid of algae and mitigate so a facultative system, we know about 60% of the lagoons out there are facultative, that big hole in the ground, but maintenance is still really important to meeting permit and protecting the environment. Very typically, facultative systems consume less manpower. They're, they're not hands-free, and you just can't forget about bank maintenance. You can't. You want to maintain the banks uh, to, to keep the higher life forms out of your ponds. Uh, you want to ensure that mowers aren't throwing clippings into or near the water. You don't have a uh, septic hauler showing up in the middle of the night dumping septage in your system. Any number of things can, can disrupt it. 
but maintaining the banks is a great place to start. You should keep the weeds down. You should keep, you know, nothing but grass near the edge of the pond. Uh, if you can do riprap, even better, like on my title slide, beautiful riprap banks there. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, you're still going to have turtles. I'm sorry, there isn't much we can do about that. But maintaining the facultative system, solids management is hugely important because you cannot overcome that reduction in treatment volume represented by growing sludge uh, by simply adding more air. You don't have blowers. And I'll tell you, cattails are just a great indicator that you've got more sludge than you should in a facultative system. They're one of the first things that you see popping up as your sludge is, is getting excessive. Seasonal turnover, neat, neat conversation there. Uh, you can form a thermocline in your ponds. Uh, basically what that means is you have a temperature inversion. We know that heat rises, but you know, over the winter you can wind up with warm water at the bottom of your pond and cold water on top of it. And when that reverses, when nature puts it back to the way it should be, a lot of times you'll bring sludge up with the warm water. This is called turnover, seasonal turnover. Uh, you hear a pond flipping. These are all terms for this. And all of them collectively are, are sludge at the surface, which has a certain amount of odor to it. That's a whole lot more than sludge where it belongs under a few feet of water. And uh, seasonal turnover is just simply unavoidable. But if you manage your solids, if you keep them to a minimum, and you, you're going to see a little bit less stink in the spring. I love this suggestion here, grass carp, grass carp. Uh, it's another way to stir the sludge in facultative cells. Uh, so I've got to say that they are technically an invasive species. Now I want to be really, really clear on this. Don't just put fish in your pond. Talk to your Rural Water Association circuit rider, talk to your regulating body, talk to your permit rider, talk to your EPA contact. Do not just throw your daughter's goldfish in the pond because you think it'll be good for your system. If you're going to do this, you need the sterile triploid grass carp. There's a resource from uh, South Carolina is where I found this one, the DNR in South Carolina. The sterile version looks different. It's a different fish. You don't want the ones that will breed. Again, an invasive species, folks don't just do it. Have the right conversations before you take this on and you know, make sure you're doing it for the right reasons and that your regulating body knows. So an aerated system, uh, you're, you're going to have a lot more to do with an aerated system. First of all, you've got blowers. Uh, blowers a lot of times have handoff auto switches and you have the ability to save a lot of money. There's a lot of engineering and, and thought that went into that handoff auto switch. Not so much the switch, more so the sequence of operation, the ladder logic, everything that's in the, in the PLC that's behind it. But it only does you a benefit when it's in auto. If you've got it running in hand, you're missing out on the on the uh, energy efficiency that you could be realizing with your system. Inlet air filters. I, I mean, I tell people monitor your monitor your uh, pressure change, your delta P across that filter media. When it hits the manufacturer's recommended uh, max delta P, pull that media, stick a new filter in there. That's the way to do it as as best you possibly can. Not everyone has the time to do that though. And if you don't have the time to track and trend and keep a clipboard with your Delta P measurements on it, if you don't have the time to do that, please, please, please add it to your, add it to your PM schedule. Get it on the calendar, do it every month, every quarter, whatever the interval works out to be. But please change those inlet air filters. They're, they're robbing your, if they're clogged and dirty, they're robbing your system of efficiency. They're costing you more money to run your blowers and you're running your blowers harder. You're, you're adding wear and tear to, to the machinery that you don't need to. Keep an eye on those inlet air, air filters, please. Oil changes very typically based on operating hours, runtime, et cetera. And uh, just look in the owner's manual. Make sure you look for anything that talks about extreme duty or, or a challenging site or locally corrosive environment or anything like that that might have a different schedule and follow the manufacturer's recommendations for oil changes. Belts. Belts are something that are, uh, oh boy, this is a neat little bit of the conversation here. Lots of, lots of fires start from belts and it's about tension. If, if the belts aren't tensioned properly there and you've got multiple belts, they're more likely to slap together, 
rubbed together, friction occurs, friction is heat, heat leads to fire, fire leads to bad things. Keep an eye on the tension and the condition of the belts on your blowers if you have belt-driven blowers. Replace them when it's needed. That PRV on the back end, the pressure release valve on the back end of the, uh, of the blower, it's important to understand what your set point is. What point should it blow off? Should you be blowing off at 4 PSI? Should you be blowing off at 8 PSI? You should know that and you know play around with it. Make sure that you verify proper operation. Exercise that valve no less than annually. If you have a manufacturer's recommendation that's more than annually, by all means, follow that manufacturer's recommendation. Another recommendation here is to know your design airflow and how to verify that you're getting the right amount. Because quite frankly, extra air is just extra expense. You're just spending money that you don't need to spend. Those aerators, I recommend that you refer to the manufacturer's guidance and follow it. Fouled membranes will steal efficiency, they'll reduce treatment effectiveness, and they'll create problems with permit compliance. Keep an eye on your membranes, keep them clean. Uh, service intervals should be spelled out in your system documents. And I'll just tell you that in, ours, in our documents, we ask municipal systems every five to seven years, pull up the aerator, spray it off, do a condition inspection. If everything's fine, put it back. The reality is that almost no one ever does this. But those service intervals on all of the pieces of equipment in your system, it's important to know what they are and try to follow them to the best of your ability. As far as aerators are concerned, keep an eye on your bubble pattern. When they're brand new, it is fantastic if you can take a picture on your cell phone so that when you're out there again, you can compare right there, stand in the same spot. Does it look like my picture? Yes or no? Yes, all good. No, let's figure out what's wrong. And I'll tell you right now that if you've got, if surf's up on your pond, if you've got waves crashing on the shore, if you're seeing little white caps that aren't coming from the wind, you have an issue. You have a problem with an aerator. And again, excess airflow is just extra expense. I think we could probably spend an entire hour on surface aerators and maintaining them. We're, we're just not gonna get there in this presentation though. Where we are gonna go next though is talking about advanced technologies. Some examples of advanced technologies, uh, triple points nitrox, oh, Nelson Engineering makes a sagger. Uh, there's any number of other products out there that are, that are you know, less frequently applied, but still doing tertiary workforce, uh, maintaining advanced technologies. And uh, for us, nitrox is ammonia. And uh, I can tell you that we've got numerous installations out there where the blower speed is controlled by VFD, and it's based on a DO monitoring sensor. And we're ramping our blowers up and down in response to the DO residual. We're measuring a residual, what's left over after the bugs have used all that they possibly need. And when you're controlling based on a DO residual, it gives you the ability to control a little bit closer, a little bit tighter to your control line and get you know, a little bit more, more efficiency out of the system. Could be a lot more efficiency, depends how out of control you really are. Uh, online analyzers, DO, ammonia, oh, I've seen them, hardness. Uh, almost all of those brands require some amount of preventive maintenance. And the lab instrumentation, pull the book, take a look, see what it says, and then get it on the calendar. Create a plan to just maintain all of your equipment, get it all on the calendar, and you know the way you eat an elephant one bite at a time. Same thing here, get it on the calendar, spread it out, don't load yourself up so that you've got one week, a quarter, where you can't do anything else because you know that won't last, that won't survive. Uh, but yeah, look at all of your stuff, uh, follow the manufacturer's instructions and keep records. That binder behind your desk is so valuable here, mainly because it's where you keep track of calibration. There's a dictionary de definition on the screen there. I'll just tell you it's verification against a standard, plain and simple, and it's how you ensure that what you say uh, either what you put in your in your reports or what you tell somebody, it's accurate. If your meter is right, if one really is one, then you know that when you say my reading is one, it's really one. And one's calibration required, eh, check the O&Ms, you're gonna find uh, information in there on it. Calibration engineer, that is a real career field. There are people that just do calibration all day, every day. It's amazing. Big companies, the Boeings of the world, they employ lots of calibration engineers. Uh, single point or multi-point calibration, it's going to depend 
on, on what the manufacturer says and also on what you're trying to measure. I do have a recommendation here that if you have a device that does not require calibration, stick a label on it. That way, if someone is walking around doing an inspection of your plant and they want to know when's the last time something was calibrated, you don't have to tell them that I don't have to calibrate that blower. You just point to the sign. Very easy. And again, put it on the calendar. Enter it in your maintenance planning software if you're using a platform for that. And that's a great way to make sure that they happen. And please, please, please keep records because that is how you're going to understand the condition of your equipment and how it's performing over time and also when it needs to be replaced. Very important to keep records. So uh, I've had, I don't know, probably a half dozen or so Myron L Ultra Meter 6s over the years. It's, it's my favorite meter for uh, pH, conductivity, TDS, stuff like that. Um, I can tell you that the manufacturer's recommendation was not in line with my employer's recommendation. Manufacturer said do pH uh, every two weeks and conductivity monthly. My employer insisted on weekly calibrations. And if I saw more than a 10% drift, I had to go to daily. I had to do daily calibrations. Uh, so it, that, that interval can be longer, shorter. It really depends on what you're measuring, what you're using, what the OEM, what the OEM says. Uh, calibration for, for the Myronel, though, uh, for pH, I was using very typically two or three different standards, uh, pH 7, neutral, and acid and a base. Uh, if I saw FAC on the screen, that said that the uh, deviation exceeded the OEM tolerance. I either needed to calibrate to a, a lower number and repeat the calibration a couple of times, or I had to replace the sensor or the meter entirely. Again, if you're not doing this, you don't know that you you don't know that your meter is experiencing problems. This is how you ensure that your equipment is is operating properly. Uh, know your equipment, know what it needs, keep records. Very important. And common mistakes, uh, failing to calibrate, using the wrong stuff, wrong standards, or using an expired standard. How can you possibly stand in front of uh, your boss or a judge someday maybe and say, absolutely, that pH was 6.2. I know it was because I calibrated the meter. If you didn't calibrate the meter, how do you know it was 6.2? Maybe it was 7.3. Who knows? You just, you can't even say. And drift, you've heard me say it a couple of times, it's easily defined as the distance between the standard and the reading. And most instruments have uh, specific instructions on how you resolve excessive drift. Uh, you may need to replace a sensor, there may be a process you follow, it may be a factory, you may have to send it back to the factory. And I encourage you to do your calibration right and sleep at night. There is just no replacement for the peace of mind that comes from saying, I am accurate and I know that I'm accurate because I calibrate my equipment and I maintain my equipment. Energy savings up next. And I've got a neat quote here from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory out in Golden, Colorado, you see there. But I'm just going to pull this out by tracking energy usage, benchmarking, making operational improvements. It doesn't say some communities. It says all communities. Every single, every single person in the audience today that's running a plant has the ability to save some money by looking at energy, looking at energy conservation. So just a quick quiz. What do you think would be the biggest single change you can make to your system to help it perform as it was designed? I think I harped on this enough earlier, but please hand off auto switches, keep them in auto, or you're missing out on all of the automation that's behind the scenes. So some fundamentals of energy consumption here. Uh, first off, a question, how do we reduce consumption in our plants? Equipment upgrades, operational changes, modifications to facility buildings. Understanding everything that, everything that consumes power in your plant is a key to reducing energy consumption. Look up, how big are the fluorescent bulbs? If they're bigger than an inch, I guarantee you, you can spend less on, on lighting in the room that you're sitting in right now today. I've got a neat quote here. I really, I've got to hand it to the National Rural Water Association. They are getting, getting very, very serious about energy conservation. And they've actually started fielding energy efficiency circuit riders. I think that the, uh, the National Rural Water Association is up to 26 or 27 states now that have a uh, dedicated energy efficiency circuit rider. Someone who works for the uh, Rural Water Association and their whole purpose 
is to go out and help plants spend less on energy, consume less energy. Hats off to National Rural Water for doing that, implementing that program. On the screen here, uh, these three pie charts, they all say basically the same thing. They say that uh, something over 50% of the energy consumed in your system is being consumed by blowers, aeration. A large, large percentage of more than everything else combined is, is being spent on blowers, on aeration. And I'm gonna call this, I'll call, call your attention to the, uh, the chart at the bottom right, because I love this. This is out of the Journal of Applied Energy, by the way. And it's a comparison of energy intensity and greenhouse gas emissions, and it compares different treatment, different treatment strategies. I love it. I love that lagoons do it better, and they know it. They know that lagoons consume less energy per cubic meter of wastewater treated. They know that the greenhouse gas emissions are less with the lagoon system than any of its more energy intensive brethren. I love that, love that little graphic there. So real quick, do you think that it consumes less energy to move air or to move water? If you said air, you're absolutely right. So bubble size matters, efficiency matters. And if you take a look on the left there, we've got, excuse me, in the, in the center of that chart, we've got SOAP, standard oxygen transfer efficiency. And you can see the highest percent per foot. It's about how much oxygen can transfer through that liquid air interface across the bubble into the water. And we see that we're getting the most out of a fine bubble and that number's dropping as we get into bigger bubbles. Thinking about what we saw in those couple of quotes, is it any surprise at all to know that a modern aerator is gonna transfer approximately three times the oxygen per horsepower hour as a surface aerator will. I don't think this is a big surprise at this point. Just simply by updating equipment and getting into newer technologies, you can dramatically reduce the amount of energy you're consuming at your plant. A quick little computational fluid dynamics here showing uh, water and air moving through our aerator. And uh, if you take a look at the, at the horizontal bars there, those are our fine bubble diffusers, and that's oxygen transfer taking place, that's aeration. In the center, we've got this orange and then red. Uh, that's mixing. Also very, very important for running a lagoon system. You need air and you need mixing. Can't, can't do it with just one or the other. Got to have both. Oh, here we go. On the screen is uh, independent verification of our oxygen transfer claims. I'd encourage you, if you're talking to someone about an aeration project, to get a copy of their third-party independent verification. And please, folks, make sure that they tested a full-scale production unit. Very important, very important to understand what exactly you're getting and to have it quantified for you. Energy efficiency is important, so is mixing. This isn't a big surprise. The level of mixing out there is going to determine how well that microorganism comes into uh, what the EPA calls intimate contact, the nutrient, the food source, and the oxygen. Bring them into intimate contact and treatment takes place. And it's an absolute scale here, or I'm sorry, relative scale here, as we see uh, we're increasing our treatment as we increase uh, from facultative over to complete mixed return activated sludge. I've got a note here also, uh, do not let your aerators get ragged up. Maintain those things, keep them, keep them in good con condition. An efficient nitrification nutrient removal. The oxygen requirements are completely different for nitrification. We know the biological community consumes large amounts of oxygen. We know that ammonia removal requires more than aeration does. Uh, I, over on the right here, I just want to point this out. Look at the difference between running a DO of two and a DO of six. You are doubling your spend. And folks, it's hard to believe. I think it could be a little bit hard to believe, but the difference between a DO of six and a DO of two could be nothing more than whether or not the DO meter's been calibrated recently. It's entirely possible that you could run a six and think it's a two. You'd be spending twice the money that you need to spend if you are. Control, controlled conditions yield controlled results. And along those lines, automation is very, very helpful as well. Uh, nitrox for ammonia is our product. Uh, the VFDs with DO sensors, and then you establish PID control. Uh, and you're ramping the blowers up and down in response to the amount of oxygen that's being consumed. Great way to right-size your, your aeration, right-size your energy bill at the same time. 
And PID control is such a neat topic. We could spend a couple hours on this, but I wanna call out a couple of things here. Uh, we're gonna start with the graphic on the left bottom. And I love, I love smoking food. I love ribs, hams, you know, burn ends, pork shoulder, do it all the time. And this is uh, actually from Pellet Grill Reviews. I don't own a pellet grill that has PID control, but the more expensive ones do. And they would suggest that you'll get better ribs off a smoker if you're running in control like that graph, that line on the left, very, very close to the control line. Over on the right, we see a great example of porpoising. Uh, you are above and below more dramatically, much more dramatically than the one on the left. This is for a smoker. This is a pellet grill. That could be a, that could be a wastewater aeration blower. That could be a uh, oh that could be a a, a a conveyor system in a in a factory in a production environment. PID control is the way to uh, run a system more efficiently. Monitoring DO is important as well. Uh, knowing that DO supports the microbial communities living in our ponds and knowing that we're measuring a residual, it's important to understand how much residual we've got. And folks, when and where you sample matters. If you take a sample in the exact same place on the exact same day using the exact same equipment, you take one before the sun rises, you take another one at solar noon, that's when the sun's at its highest point in the sky, you will have completely different readings. And just a reminder to calibrate and maintain those sensors to ensure that you're getting accurate readings. So on, in lagoons, you wanna measure DO at multiple points. You're gonna find your highest demand near the influence structure, so you should see lower DO up there, depending on how your aerators are arranged and all that. Uh, longer HRTs create differences in DO, and you know there's not a lot of value in trying to control DO uh, based on a sensor that it's the, it's, it's at or near the head of the plant uh, when you're, uh, excuse me, let me rephrase that. There's no, there's no real value in trying to control DO at the head of the plant with a sensor at the tail end of the plant if you've got 90 days of detention time. Basically, you're making a change to your blowers based on what happened three months ago. Not, not great. And automating is really a challenge for monitoring DO. A whole lot easier for uh, like tertiary ammonia removal. You grab a sample at the at the end of the process. Uh, short HRT is going to give you rapid implementation of change. You only need one sensor, so you don't have a whole lot to maintain and automate and calibrate. Uh, VFDs on the blowers take commands from PID controller. We saw that on the last slide. They ramp up and down in response to uh, what's happening inside of the reactor, inside of the, the process. Automation makes a lot of sense in this example. And folks, when you're looking at a project and thinking about improvements to your system, I'd encourage you to look beyond first cost and take a close look at uh, life cycle cost of operation. On the screen is a model that we built. This is a half a million gallons a day, uh, 10 states standards as far as loading, and uh, you know, figuring eight cents a kilowatt hour on the electric. But it's easy to open a couple of million dollar gap over the life cycle of a project. And it, it's possible that low isn't really low. Understand, understand every aspect of it, please. And uh, yep, there we go. Uh, finding a program to help you save energy in your state, do some online research, uh, ask your consulting engineer if you've got one of those circuit riders that the Rural Water Association has fielded, talk to those folks. Uh, check with your state university, they may have an extension program. Illinois has a neat public-private collaboration. Uh, CDAC is what it's called, and they'll show up and do free energy audits. You have to meet certain requirements in order to be eligible, but yeah, CDAC at the University of Illinois is a fantastic resource. Uh, they'll help you put, if you're an Illinoisan and Ameren customer, they'll help you put together a rebate that's worth about 19 cents per kilowatt hour of the first year's calculated avoidance. And by the way, that's the most generous program I've found anywhere in the United States. And of course, if you're working with us, we'll help you. Uh, more resources on the screen. There's a database. You can go out and see how your state ranks. Uh, Midwest Assistance Program, a regional program. Uh, CDAC is only specific to the state of Illinois. Midwest Assistance is regional. Great resource, great folks. Their, their, whole, purpose and their whole purpose for being is to help you do it better. And folks, my last slide here is uh, just a reminder, if you're behind on CEUs or PDHs, hit up Lagoon University and 100% uh, free, lots of content out there. 
I uh, do have some time now for questions and answers. And uh, Eve, do we have any questions inbound? And looks like yes. So the first question, uh, where do we suggest installing a DO probe in an aerated lagoon? Uh, so that that's, uh, I don't actually suggest installing it. I suggest handheld. I suggest that if, uh, if you look at the study of statistics, they'll tell you that uh, to have a statistically significant sample, you need 30 data points. I don't think there's anyone out there that wants to do maintenance on uh, an array of 30 installed sensors. Uh, so I think your best bet for uh, DO monitoring and DO probe use in an aerated lagoon is to travel around with it and use a handheld. Uh, let's see, have a question here on copy of the slides. Yeah, if uh, you'll shoot us an email on that, we'll be happy to get it over to you. Uh, can I discuss, let, let's see, I apologize. I'm having a little bit of trouble with the question window. Eve, are you able to come online and possibly read that one off for me? I can't quite make it out. Uh, can you discuss purple sulfate bacteria? Wow, PSBs. Ooh, Brett, that is a uh, that is a deep topic. Uh, PSBs, yeah. Uh, how, how about we pick that one up offline? Um, contact information right here on the screen. I'd be happy to dig deeper into the questions that you have on PSBs. Alrighty, I see one last question rolled in here. Uh, we're going to get just this last one. I may have missed it, but how often do you recommend conducting a uh, sludge survey, sludge inventory? Uh, so sludge inventory, I, I think it's going to depend on the type of pond that you're running. If you're running an average municipal pond, you're not doing anything crazy. You don't have some wild industry in town that's that's putting really, really crunchy water in your system or anything like that. I think you're just fine to do it every year or so. Um, if you're running a plant and you've got a rapid sludge accumulation rate, maybe you're playing around with an alum or a ferric feed to knock phosphorus out of your water. And by the way, folks, uh, both of those chemicals can, can dramatically change uh, your sludge accumulation rate and, and also the characterization of your sludge. Uh, but I think that if you're, if you're uh, using a chemistry like that or you're running an industrial plant with you know, much higher loading, it probably makes sense to go more frequently than annual. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's really and truly about understanding and having a good appreciation of, of where issues are, uh, are happening in your ponds. One of the things that sludge can do, and this wasn't discussed earlier, but uh, one of those negative externalities associated with sludge in the ponds is that it can form uh, channels. You can see channeling in the sludge blanket. And when you see channeling, what you also get is short circuiting. Short circuiting, as you might not, <laughs> doesn't come as any surprise, robs you of treatment. It robs you of treatment time, and it says that you're going to put out lower quality water as a result of sludge channeling. So, just one more reason to really understand your sludge. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that we have run out of time. So, I thank you very much for, for your attention. I look forward to any questions that you may have, and please feel free to reach out. Love to have a conversation with you about anything you'd like to talk about that you saw here today.